cool. Hi everyone, I'm Oscar from Underdog and today I want to go over a subject that I've gone over with my students a couple of times over the past few weeks. And that topic is something that comes back a lot um, at many stages of the music production process and it is subtractive synthesis. So a synthesizer in general is like a box that makes sound, right? Um, and 99% of these boxes have a similar set of controls on them. That if you understand the basics of how these controls work, you can shape the sound however you want. It doesn't matter if it's a digital plugin or if it's a physical hardware, they all share some features. And if you get presented with a new synthesizer, understanding how the mental model of uh, subtractive synthesis works allows you to just pick up any new synthesizer and just start messing about with it uh, from the very beginning. So we're going to go into that very briefly today in just a very short presentation. Okay, let's have a look. All right, I've gone to the trouble of making a little PowerPoint presentation because I want to show you, um, I want to show this to you in steps. Now, what, what you're looking at right now is how subtractive synthesis is usually presented and um, that's boring as heck. So we're not going to look at it like that. We're going to look at it in a different way. Um, I want you to imagine, I want you to imagine a little dude in a box, a little person, a little dude in, in a closed box, and this person is screaming all the time, just like, ah, ah, screaming, just all the time. <laughs> there you go, slide number one. Uh, this little person is just always screaming and the sound coming out of the box through like a tube into your ear the listener that's you that's the listener is you and that little dude we're just gonna call him the oscillator okay that's just you don't have to worry about why that is his name is just the oscillator and he's just a thing that's always making sound always making sound and that sound is coming out through a tube into your ear okay now that would be super annoying wouldn't it i mean that would just be that would not be musical, that would not be controls, that would just be non-stop noise. So we've got to at least, we've got to at least put one control on onto this situation, which is just a volume knob. Bam, a volume knob. You put it on that tube so that anything that comes through the tube just gets turned down, okay? Because it's too noisy. So you've got a volume knob. We also call it an amplitude knob. Sometimes the thing that's controlling it is called the amplifier. Um, in a synthesizer setup, usually whenever you see the letter A showing up, that means volume knob, more or less. Okay, so you've got this volume knob and you can like turn up the oscillator, ah, or turn it down, oh, or turn it off completely, right? Uh, that's fine, but it's not, all, again, not very musical, right? So if you have to hold your hand on it and turn it up and down all the time, that's going to get uh, very tiresome very quickly. So we do an alternative approach is we take like a piano keyboard and you say that every time that you hit a button, it opens up the volume knob. This is just an agreement we're gonna make, right? We're gonna get a piano keyboard and we're gonna hook it up electrically to this knob so that every time that we hit a, a, a note on the keyboard, it opens up the volume knob so that we can hear what the oscillator has to say. But the oscillator, even when the volume knob is down, the oscillator is still making a huge bunch of noise. And this is already very clear why we call it subtractive synthesis. Because there is sound always present and we're taking away the parts that we don't want. So most of the time we don't want to hear this oscillator guy. Only when we hit an, a note on the keyboard do we want the volume to go up and to go down. Subtractive. We subtracted the parts that we don't want. Okay, moving on. If we press down on the keyboard, and then it went to full volume. And then we let the keyboard go, and it immediately turned off, like a binary switch. That would also not be very musical. So we actually, we, we add in a curve over the top of this to sort of slow down how the keyboard affects the, the volume. And that is called an envelope. And all it is is just a curve to slow down the control of how, to, how the volume is turned up and down. That's all. So an envelope can be a little bit confusing sometimes because it's got a couple of terms to it, but all you got to realize is it's just one level of complexity for how the keyboard influences the sound. 
Let's look at the four words that you need to know to describe an, em to describe an envelope. Attack, decay, sustain, release. Attack, decay, sustain, release. Four words always written on some kind of interface with ADSR, ADSR, four buttons next to each other that describe this envelope. Now, the two easiest ones are the attack and the release. That one I can explain to you very quickly. The attack is how long does the sound take to reach the maximum? And then the release is once you've let go of the keyboard, how long does it take to go back down to zero? Just, you know, so if you want a sound that comes in slowly, you put a long attack, like a couple of milliseconds, like maybe uh, 500 milliseconds or two seconds, you know? And then once you let go of the key, if you want it to go to zero immediately, then you make a very short release. But if you want it to tail out naturally and slowly, you put a long release, like maybe two seconds release or something like this. That's pretty straightforward, right? Now, the only other thing that gets a little bit more confusing sometimes for people is the decay and the sustain, because sustain is the volume at which the sound maintains as long as you keep the keyboard pressed. So if you put the sustain at the maximum, then the moment you keep the key pressed and you leave it like that, your sound is always going to be playing at maximum volume. You could also put the sustain down to zero, which means that the sound would just have a short blip at the beginning, but then go down to the sustain level and then go, go quiet again. Like a piano, for instance, it has a sustain somewhere, a natural sustain somewhere in the middle because the first part of the sound is loud, but then as long as you hold the piano note down, it kind of has a medium volume until you let it go and then it goes down to silent. And then the decay is just how long does it take to get to that sustain level. So um, this, this entire shape is called an envelope and you can design a couple of envelopes based on what you need to have in your, in your music. I want you to imagine two typical envelopes that are super common, okay? One of them is where the sustain is at the maximum so you have an attack portion, the sound goes up to the maximum and it stays there forever until you let go of the key and then the release portion happens. That's a very common, very common uh, control. And then you just got to set the attack and the release to whatever you think is important. Then a second one that I want you to imagine is where the sustain is down at zero. If the sustain is at zero, then the sound will first go through its attack portion. Then it'll go through the decay portion and at the end of the decay portion, it'll be at zero, which is the sustain level, and it'll stay at zero. So in fact, the release becomes irrelevant. You don't have to care about the release. So really then your sound only has an attack and a decay portion, which is very good for short percussive or plucky sounds. Um, it's a very common tool to do that as well. So these envelopes, they become more intuitive once you actually see them in real life. And one thing you've got to keep in mind is that attack, decay and release are described in milliseconds and sustain is described in some percentage of the maximum. Okay, so sustain is actually a loudness. In fact, to be more intuitive on this diagram, sustain shouldn't be on the time axis, it should be on the y axis, the vertical axis. Okay, all right, let's move back. Now, let's talk about one, mo one more thing that we're going to put into this signal chain, as it's called, which is just like audio runs like water and it runs through these tubes. And at any point in the tube, you can change the audio that's flowing through it and it goes from one unit to the other. Right. So it starts at the mouth of our shouty guy, the oscillator, and it goes to this volume knob. So we can put something in, the, in between. And what we're going to put in between is called a filter, because in the same way that white light has all the frequencies of light in it. Audio also has a lot of different frequencies in it. And you can filter some of those away to make your sound brighter or darker. The same that you could filter out some light by letting through only the more red frequencies or the more blue frequencies. So you can do this to get a greater control over the final sound that's actually coming out of this thing. So you can make something more dark, make something more bright, by applying a filter. Now in most subtractive synthesizers, the filter will make things darker. 
This is called a low pass filter. It's by no means the only type of filter that there is, but many, many, many patches are built using a low pass filter. So if we continue with the light metaphor, imagine that the oscillator is giving out white light, it's passing through our filter and we're filtering out all the blue frequencies to leave only the red frequencies. And then it goes through the volume knob to set the, uh, the relative volume over time. And then it comes into your ear. So we've got a bright sound that then becomes dark, that then goes from really quiet to loud back to quiet. And we hear that then as some kind of whoom sound. Now to add a little bit of complexity to that, you often also want the color of your sound to evolve from dark to bright back to dark. That's a very common thing. So if you imagine that a dark sound would be like, ooh, like our mouth acts like a filter, right? It goes, ooh, and then a bright sound sounds like this, like, ah, so I'm not filtering the sound. It's just coming straight out. Ah, that's a bright sound. And woo is the dark sound, right? So instead of just filtering out all the frequencies and making a sound go woo, you might want it over time to evolve and go woo, wow, 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 wow. That's a sound that comes out of a lot of synthesizers and it's essentially just a filter, a low pass filter like this, controlled by another envelope, just like the volume knob was controlled by an envelope. So many subtractive synthesizers have a second envelope, the one that controls the amplifier and one that controls the filter. So the amplifier one has a little A next to it and the filter one has a little F next to it. So on the next slide, there's just an overview of everything. So if you understand this, you're in a very, very good position. You've got your oscillator, you've got your filter, you've got your volume knob, and then you've got the listener. And the filter and the volume knob are both controlled by envelopes, also called modulation sources. These are envelopes that are triggered whenever you hit the keyboard. And one extra thing that's worth noting is that the note on your keyboard will actually tell the oscillator to play a different pitch. But you don't have to worry too much about that right now. Now, if you understand this, there's only one more layer of complexity that you want to understand, and that is the LFO. So the oscillator we just described is a high frequency oscillator. It oscillates so fast that it results in audible frequencies. So our little dude in a box, he oscillates at like 15,000 times per second, let's say. Now, you can make a very slow version of him called a low frequency oscillator, LFO. And that low frequency oscillator, it might oscillate like once a second, you know, way below the audible spectrum. So you won't hear that LFO. And so with this LFO, what you'll do is you'll map it to a parameter. And let's say you'll use the LFO to control the brightness of the filter. So the filter, instead of just giving out a particular like stable red color, you could map it so that once per second, it goes a little bit more blue, back to red, back to blue, back to red, back to blue, back to red, back to blue. Not necessarily completely blue, but just a little bit so that it's a little bit unstable. So it's a little bit like pulsating. So to give to give these synthetic and artificial sounds some kind of like biological instability that we as humans adjust, like we we're very attracted to that. So having your synthesizer move in a kind of a complex and sort of a pulsating way tends to be a sound design thing that a lot of people want. So you can map your LFO to a few different things. And the most common thing, the most satisfying thing in the beginning is to map it to the filter frequency cutoff. So you have that filter actually being being changed over time. We call that being modulated. The filter is being modulated by both an envelope and by the LFO very often. So when you hit the key on your keyboard, the filter will go wow. But then as long as you hold it down, it might go wow, 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 instead of instead of just being completely stable. The complete stability, we might see that as artificial, but this slightly pulsating thing, super sweet. Now, if you've understood all this, congratulations. You now are a subtractive synthesis expert. You're welcome for this old meme. I mean, it's older, but it checks out. 
Alright, I'm gonna quit this PowerPoint presentation. Now, you could get yourself a hardware synthesizer, and all these terms are on there, and they talk to each other in this way. You can get yourself a software synthesizer, and do that as well. One of the other weeks, we're gonna take the time to go through some of the Ableton synthesizers and use this mental model to understand how the signal flows inside of these synthesizers to start creating the patches that we, that we wanna make. I hope you enjoyed this short presentation today. It was just a little tech primer to create this mental model in your mind that hopefully will help you shape your sounds to fit the songs the way you need them to fit your songs. If you wanna learn all of this, in a bit more of a structured context and actually dedicate some time to getting better at music production, join us at www.underdog.brussels where we run online classrooms where you can get better at music production. We run a beginner bootcamp and an advanced deep dive. My name is Oscar. If you like this, like the video, subscribe to the channel. That really helps with the algorithm and I'll see you in the next video. Peace out. Would you like to try making electronic music? That's what we do at Underdog Electronic Music School, based in Brussels. We offer a program called the Bootcamp Program, which is designed for absolute beginners who want to start having fun making their own music, but who don't have experience yet doing that. We run online classrooms in small groups where you and a real teacher go through 12 classes where you see from A to Z how to make electronic music and how to start having fun. You can ask any questions at any moment and you can also focus on the genres and artists that you love so that you can start making the music that you are passionate about. Check out the details on www.underdog.brussels and get in touch for a test session or to sign up for one of the classes. So, until we hear from you, see you online.